Are we recording? Yes, we are. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Columbia University Alumni Association of Sao Paulo live webinar with our very special guests, Tamara Perlman from Feira Parte, together with Pro Professor Jose Schenkman from the Columbia Business School. Our webinar today is officially our Columbia Connects event, and that is why it is extra special. Hooray to our Sao Paulo Alumni Association board colleagues, Augusto Cesar Rodriguez and Pedro La Penta for organizing this event. Thanks to them, we have this special opportunity to learn about investing in art. Re regarding today's guests, Tamara Perlman is an art appraiser and an art market consultant specialized in Brazilian modern and contemporary art. She is the co-founder and, and co-CEO of Parte Contemporary Art Fair and is a researcher with the Arts Economic Study Center at FGV Invest in Sao Paulo. Interestingly, she has an LLM from Columbia University, uh, from the Columbia University School of Law. Prior to her work in the art industry, Tamara acted as a lawyer specializing in corporate law and project finance, and then left all of that behind to work with art. We'll hear about that. Jose Schenkman is a Charles and Lin Zhang Professor of Economics at Columbia, in case you want to see, uh, at Columbia. In case you want to see this webinar again later, it will be recorded. You can access our recordings on our social media pages. Each event is posted individually with a link uh, with a recording. You can find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook under Columbia Alumni Club of Sao Paulo or by clicking on the links on the bottom part of all of our email invitations. Go ahead and follow us and like our pages. We post all of our upcoming events there as well. Just a few more words, if I may, regarding our upcoming events. Next week on Tuesday, October 6th, we will be receiving Carolina Rabelo from the ABBC together with Jose Moscati from the Accenture Consulting Firm, as well as Jose Aparecido dos Santos from Magazine Luisa, who is Magazine Luisa's legal director. Uh, the week after that, on Tuesday, October 13th, we will have the pleasure of meeting Patricia Melo, a journalist who recently received an award from our very own Colombia president, Bollinger together with Adam Shoup, the United States Consul General to Sao Paulo. All very special. We will continue to hold webinars weekly until the first week of December, and we hope that you can join us for all of them. So let's get this ball rolling. We all want to know how it is that we can choose works of art that will become valuable and not just look good on our walls. Tamara, con você. Oops, you're, you're on mute. Okay, got yeah. it. I'm sorry. I had muted myself and then I couldn't unmute myself. So I'll share my screen um, so you can see. Um, well, it, it's an honor and, and pleasure to be here with, with you today uh, and to host today's panel on art and finance with our guest speaker, Professor Shankman. Um, let me get to Um, yeah, can you see, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Got it. So here we go. Um, I'm going to make a few comments on the global art market. And if you have any questions, please send them by chat or directly to Diana. We'll have some time in the end of this presentation of, uh, after Professor Schenkman's presentation uh, to questions and answers or comments, whatever you you want to, um, to comment on. Um, well, there you go. So where to start? Uh, the data you see here come from these three reports. Uh, there are many other studies and reports on the art market, but for our purposes today, I think these are the most relevant. So these are the art market report um, by Ars Economics. It's made, prepared by an economist called Claire McAndrews. They usually make it annual. Uh, it's, uh, it's prepared also by Art Basel and UBS. It's known by the Art Basel UBS report. But this very peculiar year, they made a mid-year survey as well. And, and also very interesting is the Deloitte Art and Finance report. Uh, the last edition we have available is from 2019, but their findings are still 
useful and interesting for us. So first thing, where does the R market truly happens? Basically US, UK and China, 82% of the, of the sales uh, happen in US, UK and China. And where's Brazil in all of that? Brazil stands with less than 1%. Actually, we don't know. To be honest, uh, this number does not exist. But an educated guess would say that Brazil accounts for less than 1% of the market. This is how much the global art market transacted in the last 10 years or so. There was um, a 5% decrease from 2018 to 2019. And where, where do we stand now? People thought, uh, the, uh, people in the art industry thought things were really bad in 2019. Whoa, everything is going down like 5% less, it's, it's, it's horrible. And then 2020 arrived and the expectations were of huge, huge crushes. Um, this is from our newspaper, which is uh, a major uh, well, newspaper, web, web newspaper in, about the, the art market. And they made a survey during, in April, so the first three months of the pandemic. And they, they found out the galleries worldwide were facing a 70% income crash due to coronavirus. And that one third of them believed they would not survive the crisis. In Brazil, I have conducted, conducted an informal survey with art dealers and auctioneers, and their expectations were somewhat less pessimistic. Uh, in Brazil, they expected an average 19 drop in sales with a median of 30%, which is not as bad as their colleagues in the UK, US, and China. But let's see what we actually found out. So in the beginning of September, uh, Art Basel and UBS released the mid-year survey revealing an actual 36% average drop in sales with a median decline of 43%. Uh, smaller businesses, as you can see here, were hit the worst. And there are differences among markets. When we talk about the art market, uh, we tend to think as just one big thing, but in reality, it's different art markets, depending on the place, depending on the artist, depending on the style. So we can also see that in Asia, especially in China, the decline was much bigger, much um, dramatic than in other places. And interesting enough, in South America, they reported only a 15% 15, 15 drop. Uh, there may be many reasons for that, but talking to dealers and actioneers in the last few months, I believe this is probably, this is probably right. I mean, the art market, at least here, has not suffered as much as abroad. Uh, and also we can see that although, the, although smaller businesses suffered more, Larger galleries, larger dealers also suffered a lot, but not as much. The auction sector also had uh, what was strongly hit. Uh, we, we saw 49% um, I'm sorry, decline in auction turnover, but larger players such as Sotheby's and Christie's managed to minimize their losses and they had about 25 to 30% less businesses going, going on in their markets. So how did this not get even worse? Because of online, online sales. Uh, the art market has been known for, well, for being very restricted in, in terms of online sales with, if we compare to other markets, but during the pandemic, uh, online sales grew a lot from 10% in 2019 to about 37% in this first semester of the year. So it's huge. It's really huge. 
And the galleries in the 10 million plus segment show the highest increase from 8% to 38%. So what we saw here is that the larger uh, players, um, the most reputable and notorious players are losing the less, I would say. I wouldn't say they're gaining the most, but at least they're losing less. And what I think it's really interesting here, well, two things are really interesting here. Uh, one is a decline of the art fairs. We don't know where this is gonna take. We don't know if the art fairs will regain um, power and if they regain share in, well, not likely in 2021, but at least 2022. But it is interesting how fast the online um, channel managed to, uh, to, to grow. Um, and also another thing that is really interesting is the share of online sales by buyer category. Many new buyers entering the market during the pandemic. So this will probably change well, this has a potential, I don't know if it's a problem, but it has a potential to change the field in the coming years. And here I got some information for you on price segment. So who buys art? Lots of people buy art, you see in volume. This is from 2019, but it's probably still valid. Most works are in the less than $5,000 bracket, bracket, but they don't make in volume, they're not as significant. So there are a few players that will be the most relevant. And that, even in terms of volume and value, and even for, for different markets, that of course it changes from market to market, I mean, from country to country, but still we see that those works that are over $1 million are truly, truly important for the market, like 42% of the trade. They, rep they represent 42% of the trade. So who buys them? Who buy such works of art? You've got to have a lot of money to do that. And that's why high net worth collectors are so important. And that's why most reports will look deeply into their buying and collecting habits. This is, uh, this is from the Art Market Report uh, from Art Basel and UBS. And I think it's, it, it shows us why we should look into high net worth collectors with a lot of detail. Uh, on aggregate, the size and distribution of sales in the art market has been correlated with key economic variables over the long term. And now it comes, particularly with the growth and distribution of high net worth wealth. So, Although it does have a lot to do with economic growth and all, it is closely, the, the growth and decrease of the, of the art market uh, is very, very and strongly correlated with the growth and distribution of high net worth wealth. So it's not by accident that the larger markets are the US, UK, and, and China. Um, this, is, uh, th this is data from the Deloitte Art and Finance Report. And I, I like to show this because people usually think that collectors buy art mostly for emotion. And it's, it's still, it's true. They usually buy for collecting purposes, but more and more, they want at least not to lose money. I mean, most collectors will buy something that they love, that they think it's important, it's relevant. Actually, most people will buy art into that, and some some of art some of the art buyers will become addicted to it and becomes and then turn into serious collectors. And when they do, they start thinking about, well, I'm collecting for the the because I love art, but I. I want to make sure that I'm not losing money, at least. And and well, and wealth management services, mostly in the U.S. Uh, and Europe, also in China, but not in Brazil. And I don't know why. Maybe someone can explain that to me. They have more and more uh, provided services 
uh, art-related services to their clients. 84% of our collectors say they want to include art and other collectibles in their wealth reports. And talking about Brazil now, I believe this is probably, too, probably true here as well. Although I don't know of many wealth managers who take this seriously. Um, this, is, this is another, uh, except from the UBS and Art Basel report. This is the share of collectors by level of total expenditure in the first semester. So even though the crisis hit hard on everyone, 92%, it doesn't show here, but um, uh, information is there, 92% of the collector survey said they bought at least one piece of art in the first six months of the year. And this is interesting how this is distributed. So we see that millennials, are the ones most willing to spend in art, and the boomers are the most conservative ones. The numbers, the number of works uh, did fall from six to four, and then we see why China was hit so hard, like almost it's half, and US and UK not as much, but still they, they are active. And not only they're active, but 82% of them said they plan to attend exhibitions, art fairs, and events in the next 12 months. So they're very optimistic about the market. 57% hope to attend these events both locally and overseas. And almost 60%, 59% of them felt the pandemic had increased their interest in collecting. And 31% think significantly so. I've been feeling this here in Sao Paulo. We don't have numbers from, from Brazil, for Brazil because it's such a small market and, and not much research is done about, we don't have data, to be honest. We don't have data to, to make these, these kind of studies. But I've been feeling this increased interest in, in collecting and also at, a, at having a financial look at it, an investment look at at art. Um, I'm gonna finish with, with this slide here from the Deloitte art and, art and Finance Report. Puts here some art trends. This is from 2019, but it's still, it, it is still valid. And some financial trends. So art and finance are really coming together just as, as much as the, let me get here. Millennium collectors are increasingly important in this market. They also ask for more finance, for financial services. So risk management and collection management, asset allocation, uh, art secured lending, um, the financialization, art as a capital asset. All those trends are shaping the, the art market from now. And I believe they they will be they will increasingly so increasingly shape the market from now on uh i put here it's not in the in in, in the lights um report but the art tokenization is purely art as art as an investment i mean you buy a token of an artwork and then you sell it and you don't even have to look at it so this is something that is is likely to change the market and with this really, really quick, really broad overview, I'd like to pass on to Professor Shankman because I, I'm looking forward to hearing Thank from you, her. Tamara. Thank you very much for your very good, very interesting presentation. So should I go just ahead and share my screen? I'll do this. For some reason, my screen is not showing what it should be showing. I see what I'm doing. Yeah, it's here. I think it's already here. Can you see it? Can yeah. you see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. So, um, we're going to talk about artist investment. 
have a little bit of finance to do to start to say why is it that the artist is an interesting question for the economist. And that has to do with the fear of bubbles. Um, the history of financial markets is dotted with the speculative episodes, they're often called bubbles, period in which asset prices seem to vastly exceed fundamentals. There's not much agreement among economists why, what is the economic mechanism that generate these episodes. And this is basically because a lot of discussion of speculation asks about prices. Have prices have been going up? Did they fall? This is really a hard discussion because there are many reasons for prices to go up and go down. So with a group, this started Excuse with me, a group Professor. That, yes. I'm sorry to disturb you, but we cannot see your, your screen. Could you, could you try to share it again? Okay, I can share it again. Uh, so I have to go back to, okay, let's see if that works. Share screen, okay? Okay, and that's it. Um, no, I have to go back to to the Chrome, right? To to the uh, okay. I have now. I have our Zoom screen, so. Okay, here you are. So how to, I'm going to share screen and nothing seems to happen because I have the zoom on top, you know? I have your, I have a picture of Tamara, not Tamara, of Diane, uh, just in front of me. So what mm -hmm. should I do here? There we go. Here you go, yeah. It worked? Yes, it did. Yep. Can you see my transparencies? Great. Your zoom page. Okay, great. No, okay, yes, great. now we got it. Everybody, okay. So, so I'm sorry. So, so the question that I'm saying, the discussion of speculation usually only concentrate on prices. And a few years ago, with a group of colleagues then at Princeton, where I was, we started um, some kind of additional empirical irregularities that help determine reasonable mechanisms that generate these episodes. And the, one of the things we found is that Asset price bubbles always coincide with increase in trading volume. People trade a lot during asset price bubbles. I'm going to talk a little bit about how that has to do with the market of art. But if you look at the stock market, really you have a lot of trading during periods of speculation. Okay. And the second is that these periods of speculation end or these asset price bubbles implode seem to coincide with increases in asset supply. The way bubbles end is not because people wake up one day and say, oh, now I think those prices are too high. That somebody figures out a way of producing the assets that people want to buy. Historically, you can find it all through the history of bubbles. That's how they end. They don't end up because people become rational. But they end up because people, all of a sudden, there is an increase in asset supply. So how does a theory like this work? I'm not going to get into a lot of discussions is that when you buy, let's suppose, a piece of art, you buy in the enjoyment of the art that Tamara talked about, but you're also buying an option to resell. At some point, you may want to resell that. And typically in art, you are the only one or only the few people that own that piece. It could be a multiple, in which case there'll be a few people. And so that the fact that you have the right to sell is a, is a, is a fact that you have and not, nobody else has. In finance language, Nobody can short your asset. If I own a particular piece by Eliot Seeker, a great Brazilian artist, um, I have that piece and I'm the only one who can sell it. So how did I got to this? This is joint work with Julian Penas and Luke Hedeburg. Julian is in Luxembourg, Luke is in, 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 the, in uh, the Netherlands, he's Flemish Belgian and he teaches in the Netherlands. They're both art economists. And we thought, can we think about applying these theories to art? And there are two things that you have to have for the theory to apply. First, there must be volatile differences in opinions in art. On the sense that if I buy something today, I have to have the hope that in the future, there'll be somebody who's going to really love that art. It's not, and that person doesn't love that piece of art now. Otherwise, 
that person will be bidding against me. Okay, so I buy and then I acquire this opportunity to resell when that piece of art goes up. Okay? And the second, you cannot short. Once you, if you want to sell a piece of art, you have to own it. Now, Tamara talked about tokenization. That's going to be another stage that's going to allow for more speculation, but let's, let's, let's leave that aside. So, Kenneth and Brenda Book had already examined this theory that I had developed with my colleague at Princeton, and he, they showed two things. There is a positive correlation between the volume of trade, you know, how much auction volume you get, and prices of art. So tomorrow we're showing that 2020, there's a shrinkage in the volume. You can pretty sure see that prices are going to go down to when people really examine this. And second, if you buy something in a high volume, you tend to have a lower return, which means if you buy something in a high volume period, you're paying too much, okay? On average, of course. Now, think about the death of an artist who is relatively young, okay? What does he do? That death decreases the output that's gonna be available relative to the counterfactual where the artist survives and does should lead to a higher price because there's less of that stuff, but also more speculation like I argued before. And that means it's gonna turn around more, okay? And that's what we're gonna to try to examine, okay? Now, Tamara already mentioned that there's a lot of speculation in art. Today, she talked about um, several things, several ways in which you can speculate in art. One of the things that most me fascinate me is that there is an infrastructure that has been developed to facilitate speculation. Uh, outside uh, LaGuardia Airport, uh, there's a, a facility called WOVO, and there's a similar one in Luxembourg, uh, near the Luxembourg Airport, called Freeport. And what, it, what those facilities are, are places where you can, they are tax-free facilities, so I can bring a piece of, I can buy a piece of art, in, this, in an auction in New York, I don't pay sales tax, I just send it to Ovo. I can buy Luxembourg, I don't pay VAT, and I can hold it, and then somebody else can come and buy it. And that person is not gonna pay VAT if they live outside the United States, in the case of Ovo, or if they live outside Europe, in the case of Luxembourg, or they can just hold it there. So that's the modern phenomenon that we all, that Tamara was telling us about, but it's actually a very old phenomenon. Okay? So Peggy Guggenheim, you, anybody interested in art know who Peggy Guggenheim was. She is the niece of the founder of the Guggenheim Museum in New York, but she's also herself one of the great collectors of abstract American art, post-war, you know, um, American art. And she also has a great museum in Venice. And a lot, a lot of her collection is actually on, it's actually at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And she wrote a, a book in 1960 called Confessions of an Art Addict. And she says the entire art movement, this was because she had been out of New York for a while living in Italy, and then she comes back and she writes, the entire art movement had become an enormous business venture. Some buy merely for investment, placing pictures in storage without even seeing them, phoning their gallery every day for the list to quotation as though they were waiting to sell stock. So speculation in art is a real phenomenon. So that's what we're gonna to try to understand. Does the fall in expected supply increase prices and turnover as the theory of speculation that I've developed with colleagues predicts? Um, so the first thing is that increasing price is a natural consequence of any theory in which supply affects prices. But here we're gonna provide you with a measurement. We're gonna provide you with a number. But increase in turnover is less obvious, and it's really particular to the theory of speculation. I'm also gonna to try to discuss alternative explanations. Now, data. What data are we gonna use? We're gonna use auction data. Tamara was talking about recent auction data and reports she was talking about. There are two sources. One is the Blue Ant Art Sales, and it's called Auction Club. They cover auctions between 1957 and 2016. We reduced all the prices as the hammer price in 2015 dollars. And we restrict the extension to the 2,270 artists which were alive in 1957. So we can ask the question, what happens when they die? Our data started in 57. What is our focus is that 246 artists 
who passed away before turning 66, no later than 2015. We're gonna to refer to these artists as the treated artists in our experiment. So these are the artists who died at a relatively young age. We're gonna also look at the even younger ages, but 66 seems to be a good cutoff, and died no later than 2015. Now we know these death events all spread over the sample, so we don't have to worry about particular times. And here's the question I'm gonna ask. Eva Hess, for those of you who don't know her, was a great artist. She was one of the founders of the so-called post-minimalism. Her, her work is in every collection of every major contemporary art museum in the world. But she died in 1970 at age 34. So her, her work comes into auctions. Um, and we'd ask the question, what would have been the prices if she had not died in 1970 at age 34? Now, how are we going to construct? So we construct what's called a control group, a group of artists who didn't die, but on average look a lot like the ones who died. So how do we construct this control group? First of all, we started picking a random year and picking a treated artist, somebody who died young, let's suppose Eva Hess. And then we require the matched artist to be born within a 10 year interval of the artist we're interested in of Eva Hess in this case. And it is presently alive, presently for us mean after 2016, that's how our data ends, or passed away at an older age, older than at least 66, okay? And live for 10 years after the treated artist. So we can see the difference between art production, okay? Now, how do you want to match? If the treated artist sold before death, want the matched artist to have average sales and volume within a certain range of the treated artist in the last 10 years before the treated artist that life. Now, in the case you have no prior sales, we look at a measure that we not denominate fame, which are obtained from the Google digitized books, how many mentions in the Google digitized books, and then try to also to have the two in the same range, okay? And the Google digitized books are measured only up to the date of the death of the art of the first stuff. Now, if one or more match found, we kind of minimize the distance between the two. We do not replace, so we have a set of controls which is equal to the to the to the set of treated artists. We only find 242 of the possible 246 matches. Why do we find less controls? Well, the artists were really unique. One example is Basquiat. Basquiat died very young, was selling at auctions very young, uh, was a famous guy very young. There's nobody else like him, you know? So we couldn't find a match for Basquiat. So Basquiat is out of our, our sample. Another artist who didn't die so young, but was already very famous in 1957, and there are no matches of people that were born within that age and died after that, which is, Giacometti, Giacometti also we couldn't find a, 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 a match, but those are super famous artists, so it doesn't bother us. Now, if we do that for Eva Hess, we pick up Yoko Ono. Now, of course, Yoko Ono became very famous as John Lennon's wife, but much before that, she was a very important artist for what was called the Fluxus Group. So if you go to MoMA, MoMA has a very large collection of Fluxus that they got from a donor. And she got, um, and there's a lot of pieces from Yoko Ono. The Flux group included people like uh, John Cage, of course was more a musician than an artist, but a very important one. Also Pike, the Korean who invented video art. Dieter Rott, which is a great artist from Iceland and Switzerland, um, uh, but it was also part of the New York group. You can also be, find other matches, search Polyakov, Great French artists all of quite minutes here. The fact that they are both French is just a coincidence. Anna Bendieta, the great artist who apparently was murdered by her husband, but the husband was found not guilty. It's a little bit like uh, Angela Denise's case. Not really, I don't know exactly what was the reason, but he was found not, not guilty. And she's matched with Marie Dambramovic, which is, of course, a great living artist. 
because we're talking about Brazil, I selected a Brazilian, Antonio Bandeira, who was a great Brazilian artist who died very young. He died at 45. And his match, match with Carlos Cruz Diaz, who the New York Times just died in 2019 after leaving almost 90 years, right? And uh, Carlos Cruz Diaz, uh, according to the New York Times uh, obituary, is the most important of all the Latin American artists of the second or uh, of the post-war period, according to one of the most important. So they're both very important artists. Now, you should keep in mind the individual matches, you can be curious about the individual matches, but they're not important. Because all we care is that we construct this group that looks like the other group. And if you look at all characteristics, there's a table here. I, I suppose the, the Columbia Alumni Club can keep this, uh, make these uh, uh, transparencies available. They are very much like, where they differ is something like at which age they died. Of course, we're trying to compare people who died young who people who didn't die young, but everything else, they're very famous, similar. Now, I'm not gonna write equations, but I wanna to explain to, me, to you what you do is what so-called hedonic regression is about. The idea is to make a regression, compare the price of works of arts, which are sold a certain time from a special artist. So we're looking at the price of each work of art sold by artist I near T, okay? And you're comparing with a bunch of variables that are supposed to indicate how something about the work of art, you know, what's the medium, what's the size, what is the, what is the, what is the artist's age, what's his notoriety. Notoriety for us means he sold previously as Sotheby's or Christie's in New York or London, that's a high notoriety person, or he exhibited previously a documenta, which is still the most important show for modern and contemporary art, art in the world. We could also include fame, it wouldn't make a difference. But it will also have artists and ear fixed effects. So ear fixed effects are introduced so that whether you look at a piece of art that's sold in a booming year or in 2020 will make no difference because we're only going to compare pieces of art sold in the same year. And second, whether the artist was a man or a woman, whether um, he was a, a contemporary artist or a modern artist. It doesn't really matter. All that is controlled because we control the name of the artist. What we don't control, what the only part of, that we leave off are things like age and notoriety. Okay, so the coefficient of interest is coefficient of beta one. What happens when a person dies? And we're trying to figure out how much the prices go up when a person dies. Beta one then is, is this coefficient. There's a similar thing for, for volume. You run a similar regression on volume. Volume has to be a positive number, so you non-negative number, so you worry about that. So the price, the price you can take logs. Volume, we don't take logs. And here's what we find, okay? We're gonna just talk about a few numbers. There's a big table here, don't think about that. But basically, if you, an artist dies before 66, so he's 65 or younger, okay? The prices on average go up by 55% relative to somebody who dies later. And the volume is, goes up by 63%. People trade a lot if an artist dies young. That's what's phenomenal. That's what's very interesting. So everything the speculation theory predicts that people speculate more on artists whose death is, you know, they, they die relatively young and pay more for it seems to be true from the data. Now, the effect on prices are permanent. So it's not like the typical bubble that's gonna implode. Prices go up when somebody dies and stay up forever. Forever, as you can see, up to 10 years. Volume is the same thing. And the other thing, this is not a Van Gogh phenomenon. Uh, People who die and are unknown, so they have very little fame, they live few citations, their prices don't go up. Maybe you can, there's always a Van Gogh somewhere, but don't bet on it, okay? By the way, I think uh, contemporary art historians think that Van Gogh was much more famous than what is, what is, um, what is attributed in, in popular lore. But that's another story. Now, 
The other thing is that the older you die, this death effect declines. I do here for prices, you get the same thing for volume. By the time you're 75, you die, you have no effect. Even by the time you're 70, you have not that much effect. So the effect is all concentrated, but if you die before 50, you get a big effect. You know, here the, 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 the little dots are the average effect and the, and the bars represent the uncertainty we have. We also do a placebo test. It's very common in this literature. We think, let's take the control artists, okay, and then find matches for them and see if, we, if it looks like the death of this control artist would bring also uh, a, an increase in price and volume. It doesn't. So the phenomenon we're seeing is really legitimate. Now, so I get to the time of my conclusion. That's good, we have time for discussion. First of all, art auction is a good market for testing theories of speculation. That is my interest as an economist, okay? The volume effect of premature death supports theories of speculation that are based on impossibility of shorting and volatile difference in beliefs. Now, there are some people who have calculated the returns on art investment. Now, what economists try to do is what we call risk-adjusted returns. There's a paper by Carter Wagon co-authors that showed that the risk-adjusted excess returns on art investment is about half what you get if you invest in the U.S. stock market. Okay? And by the way, that doesn't account for the substantial transaction cost in art. Uh, auction houses charge quite a bit to sell your stuff. Okay, or well, the buyer is going to pay quite a bit to buy your stuff. It doesn't really matter if whoever pays. Okay, now we also look at return at repeat sales. And if you look at repeat sales, that is, you look at the same piece of art bought before death and after death, or before death and sold after death, or bought after death and sold after death. There's a huge difference in returns. If you buy before death of an artist who dies young and sell after death, you make money. That seems to be a good industry. I have a good uh, quote on this. You know, and Andy Warhol uh, was a very good friend of Basquiat. And Andy Warhol um, writes on his diaries, actually, uh, that the entire art market found out there was an artist who was a great artist, but it was also a drug addict. And they all bought it on the hope he was going to die soon. Now, he's writing this about two years before Basquiat died, and, but about five years before, after Basquiat became famous. So he says, Basquiat has survived all those five years, the last five years, so they're all feeling very bad about their investment. Um, so let me finish. I think that making money on art investment is very difficult with the possible exception of the purchases that precede an expected death of an author. Now that's some regression. I'm talking about there may be people who really know about which author are gonna become hot. I think some people know. Some people really think people are gonna become hot and they don't become hot and some people really know. Of course, the people really know, I can't, you get the average price, the price is just an average. So my advice to art buyers is, is I buy art. I buy mostly concrete art from Brazil, so I should have a conversation with Tamara. Um, but I, I buy art because I enjoy it. You know, I wake up every, every day in the morning and go to my, after I, when I'm having breakfast, I walk into my living, part, different parts of my art by house and look at specific pieces of art. Mm -hmm. So I look at for a long time the art that I love. And I think that, of course, I don't want to buy something that I could buy much cheaper next week. But um, it really what I'm getting is the value that I get from enjoying the art. Thank you, guys. Hmm. For the Wonderful. Well, we have, we have a few questions here. We have one from Julio Landman. There seems to be a tendency to eliminate the middlemen between the artist and the buyer. How do you see this? Who would like to answer that? I think that's a Tamara question better than me. I have an opinion, but I can tell Tamara, I think Tamara really knows about it, right? whereas I only have an opinion. Um, it seems that it seems to have a tendency for that, but 
Honestly, I don't see that that happening anytime soon. I mean, artists still need someone to take care of their career and, and then they can concentrate on their work. Um, so I don't see that happening. I mean, for many artists, I think this is a good, um, I think this, this might be a good choice, depends on the artist, but and it depends on the market. But if the artist really wants to achieve, um, I know having his works in museums, collections, or with major collectors, that would probably not happen if he works by himself. I mean, obviously, there are exceptions. There, there are always exceptions. But in general, I don't see that happening because it's not something that you can do by yourself. I mean, it's a lot of work. Pricing and marketing and selling your work and explaining and giving meaning to your work and having um, the, um, the, the, the discourse of the, about your poetic. Sometimes the, the artists don't, simply don't explain their, their works well. So that's, that's how I see it. How, how do you see that, Professor Schenkman? I exactly like you. I mean, I'm not a specialist. You, you really know the, uh, the field, but my, you know, one of the things I try to understand when I was doing this work is what do dealers bring in as opposed to auctions? And dealers bring in a lot. And that's why, for instance, almost every artist has a, has a representative uh, a gallery that rep everybody good artists as a gallery that represents them, and a state really works through galleries. I had long conversation with one of the top lawyers in the world on artist estates here in New York, of course, and he told me something very interesting. He said, "Look, you know, if you don't have, you know, artists gallery uh, dealers bring a lot of help to states too, not only to artists alive but to estates." to maintain the estates, the artists in the museum kind of looks and to, and it, what's interesting is that almost, you know, the huge volume of what's sold in auctions, direct they are sold in auctions, come from secondary sales. Most, are, most artists don't want their, their, you know, there's a great quote from, what's the great American photographer, the, great, the greatest of the American photographers, uh, and he has this quote, which I like a lot. I forgot his name. He has this quote, the last thing I want is to have my work ha handled by auctioneers. He was explaining why he's appointing. He's still alive, but he said... Uh, Chuck, he was, Chuck Close, isn't it? Chuck, Chuck Close, yes. Yeah. Chuck, Close. Chuck Close said that. Why he was appointing a gallery to do also his estate. You know, of course he has a gallery. So I think some people may be able... I mean, I don't know of any... Uh, the artists at least I'm interested in, the ones who are alive, even though I know I've met some of them and so on, they wouldn't sell it to me. They're, they have to go through a dealer. Okay, talk about not selling art. I, I'd like to ask a question. I have a friend who, I have a, a couple of friends and they're big art investors. And so we asked them, uh, you know, when you see that there's a work of art that can make money, could you, that's gonna increase in price, could you let us know so that we can invest? And the answer was that the galleries or the art dealers will not sell to us. And that has to do also with, a, with what you pointed out regarding, you said that, no, that when you own a piece of art, it can't be shorted, they can't short it. On the other hand, according to our friend, when a big gallery sells you a work of art that they want to make, an artist that they want to make famous, you can't sell the piece of art. If you sell it, then, then they'll never sell you another piece again. Well, it's worse like than that. Good galleries, you know, I just uh, purchased a William Kentridge. Kentridge is a great artist, but he's alive. And uh, he's represented by one gallery here in New York. And you sign a piece of paper saying, I cannot sell that piece of art for five years. And right. after that, I have to show it to the guest. I have to give uh, some preferences. So it's a complicated, it's a complicated deal. I think every, that's one of the reasons artists like to go to dealers because the dealers can protect them from somebody who's just trying to trade. You know, for whatever reason, whether it's a real economic reason or because they want to, to they think it's bad for them morally or whatever reason, they don't want their art to be sold to people that are gonna trade. And so they want to sell their art to people. We have keep the stuff for a certain amount of time. You know, they know that people have life events 
you know, there are people I know that I could never afford the Richard Serra, but I know the Richard Serra, for instance, not only, he never allows you to sell his art, his insight art, which is a great majority of his art, of course. He doesn't, he doesn't allow that. So you have to kind of guarantee, you have to sell your house if you want to sell his insight art. So that's one big uh, reason uh, to buy from a, So that's one big reason to buy from a from an important art gallery. So you have a higher chance because they're holding the the supply. They, they won't sell it to you if you don't sign. That's the point. I don't know right. what tomorrow's experience is. The limited experience with that, but yeah. I was forced to sign in those cases of live that art. Happens, yeah, that, that happens in Brazil as well, but not not as much as you you would see in New York or UK. No, not as much. I mean, it, it does happen for certain artists and certain galleries, but it's not as common. Uh, another question regarding uh, investing in what they call blue chip art. Uh, there is actually, it seems that there's a fund called Ma Masterworks. I don't know if you're aware of, of that fund. And what they do is that uh, through them, you can invest in blue chip art, such as uh, Basquiat or George Kondo or Zhao Wuqi or Andy Warhol. Uh, uh, is that a scam or is that something that's worth investing in? Well, that Tamara knows the fund probably better than I do. Personally, you <laughs> could have a fund like this, I imagine, but I don't know the specific, I don't know anything about specific funds. I, I don't know the specifics either. I mean, yeah. uh, there are all sorts of funds, of art funds. I don't know this one specifically. I, I, think, it, I think this one has, Something to do with tokenization, I think. I think you can buy like a share of, of these works, right? So I don't want to say it's good business and then people will come after me and say, well, I bought a token of it. And it's hard to say. You have to, to analyze each work individually. But it does have uh, the potential to to change s some markets when you turn a, a work of art into into to into tokens and spread it then the work the the dealers are doing of restricting trade it it changes it changes a lot you're right tamara but it's kind of strange right because you're going to pay unless they have to, uh, some form of income in which they rent their art so because if you buy a piece of art and have it in a wall, I mean, you're going to get enjoyment out of it. Now you're going to buy a token. I mean, it's kind of hard to get enjoyment out of the token. Um, maybe you will. But in, if you don't, you're losing that stream of service. It's like buying a stock and not collecting the dividends. That's, that's the analogy for, for investment. You know, uh, it's true that some stocks don't pay dividend for a long time, but eventually you believe they're going to pay dividends. And the history says many stocks that never pay dividend for a long time started paying dividends. So eventually. So I don't know. I feel that it's a, it's a business which is a, a little bit strange on the side of art. I think, I think people like Tamara can help you buy art that you don't overpay because that's also a problem when you're buying art because often when you're buying art, you have no idea what the thing trades for. And people like Tamara can help you do that. I myself had gotten into the habit of looking at the Bluon prices when I'm looking at art, auction prices. And I realized that there are artists that go through periods in which a lot of their sales are not realized, which basically indicates that people have a excessive expectations about what they can sell it for. So it's not really clear because uh, they, don't, don't they, they don't reach the minimum reserve. Now, often these people may have had a deal with, uh, with the auctioneer in which the auctioneer guarantees them. They may, I know people that actually work in that business. They basically give reserve below the reserve to, 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 to sellers at auctions, and then they get paid a premium for that. So that's, there are different things that can be had, but clearly the price quoted, the reserve price at least, is too high sometimes. Yeah. And people like Tamara can tell you, you know, this doesn't look like a good reserve price because you know the market. 
I couldn't. Yeah, I, I, I don't like, well, not that I don't like, I think it's really hard to tell, oh, this is good investment. It's really, really hard to tell. And what I can, and I usually say, well, this is fair price or it's not fair price. You can find something better for the same amount of money. But if, if this is the thing that you like, go ahead. I mean, don't expect uh, to, to have a profit out of it, but enjoy it. If you become a successful investor in art over and over again, that means you're a dealer, you're not an art collector anymore, which is fine. It's okay. But this is a different activity. You're, now you're a dealer. And, and some people, some collectors turn into dealers and that's very common too. But then they, they, they do this work. They'll have several works from the same artist. They will um, work on exhibitions. They will build uh, the, the artist's reputation just as a dealer does. Right. And some collectors will do that. And many yeah. times when, uh, when we see collections and we see them through time, what happens is that three to five percent of the works will gain in value so much that you have the impression that all the collection became X percent more valuable, but it's just, just, it's just a portfolio when the person managed to choose the right for these three to five percent. And this is very common. So, well, it's a good investment. Yes, if you can build a, a large portfolio. But most people will not do that. They will have like up to 30, 40, 50 pieces of art. And that's already that's a lot. lot. And that's a lot. And I mean, th th this is already a collector and it's not, not enough. not enough to be in that business that you said. You're right. Yeah. There's a question here from Denise Menconi. And I, I think this, I, I, I've, I've felt this personally. Have you ever seen an art, art prices go down or that the artist or work just disappears from the market? I, I bought a Terus a few years, about 25 years ago. It's worth nothing today. Oh, I've seen some Terus at auction. Yeah. <laughs> I'll sell you one. <laughs> <laughs> But that, that happens, of course it does. Yeah. Well, you know, most, I, most artists will disappear. They will not be in exactly. art history. And even some great artists, would do somewhat, their, re, their later work would kind of disappear. So Salvador Dali is an example. His early work is unbelievable. The stuff he did or he didn't do, nobody knows if he did it or not. When he was old, he's junk. So you always, you know, there's different artists have different, uh, you know, fears in their life. They may produce, they may be great artists for a while, and then they may decide, I'm not gonna, going to make more money doing whatever, or his relatives decide we're going to make more money making him do whatever, which seems to have been the case in Bali. That's how it goes. Have you studied which country has produced uh, the most big artists? Or what well, area it depends on the been... time. I mean, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the re post Renaissance, you have some areas which are really amazing, like parts of northern Italy, parts of Italy, parts of uh, what are then called the Low Countries. They don't know that maybe Belgium, that maybe Holland, that maybe Luxembourg. But nobody knows where those, or even northern France, some of it. Uh, so oh, those are areas that produce amazing artists. You know, the post-war period, you have a lot of American artists that became very famous. And Europeans even have a paranoiac view of that. They think the CIA did it. So by promoting, uh, you know, abstract expressionism and things like that. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't think um, that will vary a lot. Now, it's amazing in Latin America. I think Latin America has a lot of very original artists in a relatively short period. You know, but incredibly original artists, both in Brazil and Venezuela and Argentina and Uruguay, two of the countries that produce amazing artists post-war, um, like in the 50s and 60s. I don't think, but tomorrow may be, may be correct, no, that I don't think contemporary art in any of these countries has the weight 
that the artists that were producing at that time have. Or well, maybe. Well, I, I've been thinking, I've been thinking to myself, Mexicans such as... Uh, uh, um, Mexico has yeah, also yeah. very pretty. Right, yeah. right, or Frida Kahlo, or that's... Yeah. That's a little fewer than the, the, the rest of Latin Americans, I'm saying. Because people are like interwar artists. What about modern art and contemporary art? Modern art, Tamara. What artists should we look at today in Brazil? Hmm. Oh, come on. I, I don't like these questions because when, <laughs> no, because when we choose someone, we always leave so many behind, right? So it, it's, it's really hard. Um, if I... <laughs> That that's really hard. I, I think I, I was actually I was thinking of the other question about uh, what country produce most great artists. I right. and I was linking this to to the what to the criteria you used in your paper in your research, uh, Professor Schenkman, of an artist having exhibited at a documenta or. So the Sotheby's and Christie's, London or New, or New York. I was thinking about that. Well, that means that this art, this country is, is probably more preeminent in that time. So it, it doesn't have to do with the quality of art necessarily. And also what I've been seeing a lot is how some artists are, are being kind of discovered or rediscovered or they, we're giving them their work different meanings today. So this also happens. So there are many Brazilian artists that we didn't look into at their time, and then we're looking at them now. Uh, there is a, a well-known dealer in Sao Paulo called Jacqueline Martins. She does this work. I mean, she'll go into uh, unknown artists from the 70s and 80s, and she'll Re represent their work. So it's hard to say, oh, you should look into this, this, and that. You should look into things that may make your heart beat, that are interesting to you. Because there is no, no guarantee that they will, that, that you make a profit out of it. Um, there's a great likelihood that you want, that you will not. Maybe you're Children will, because these things may take a lot of time. So, honestly, research I agree, is like fine. It's like you know, the only that. thing, yeah. the only thing that we use criteria such as that, not that we think is a good criteria, but it's a good mm -hmm. criteria to match. If so, if you're comparing two artists and one of them exhibit documenta before, you know, death, even though he died in ground to be young, with another artist. That more or less at that age group would have also at that age have exhibit documenta. That doesn't mean that exhibit documenta is a mark of a good artist, but that's something that I think the market looks at. So I would expect the people that exhibit documenta have higher prices even before that. Uh, and of course, because, and they will also have, um, uh, and the same thing of somebody who sold, that's why we couldn't match Basquiat. To match Basquiat, we really we get a stronger result because he's a guy who died young and his prices went through the roof. But matching Basquiat is kind of unfair because the guy is so prominent at such a young age, there's nobody like him. So if we widen the criteria and sense to say, okay, we're gonna let anybody be Basquiat pair since we then we just make our results stronger but without any economics, real economics behind it. So I agree, but it's not a good that's probably we didn't study, but there must be, a, I, I don't know how good a signal for prices after that is the documenta thing. It may not be such a good, such a good, maybe if many people did a bit document and never afterwards they are discovered to be frauds. I have some favorites that I would claim will be discovered as frauds, but I won't mention. I have a quick question from uh, our uh, judge, Mileni Ramos said that she'd like, she'd like to know, and I think that we could ask this question to the two of you. What is the artist that most surprised you in terms of becoming more valuable than expected? <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> there is one from Brazil. A good question. A yeah. good question and a tricky one. Uh, since I, I well, I, I follow the Brazilian market much more than other markets. Um, Lucas Arruda is one of them here. I didn't expect um, prices for his work to go this high as they, they have been in the past couple of years. His opinion. What about you, Professor again, I don't, I don't, again, I don't know much about individual artists, but there's something about the arts of the 60s, both in Brazil and the US, that it's clear that the artists themselves did not expect to become famous and last. So if you look at Eva Hess as an example, her medium it really drives, drives uh, museums crazy because it's almost impossible to keep in pristine conditions because you know it's their piece of cloth which are have been you know painted and they, they you know they're very very fragile. If you want a similar experience from 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 a Brazilian artist. You have Pitisica. A meta schema is a super sense, you know, it's almost impossible. Most meta schemas have some signs of deterioration. And I don't think, maybe Tamara knows about it, I don't think that problem has really been solved even by the top museums. We can spend a lot of money and a lot of, you know, smart people trying to restore what they have. Because he wasn't thinking, you know, if you paint, you put wash on a, on a cardboard, what are you thinking? You're thinking that, you know, next week somebody's going to throw it out or something, you know? But that's what yeah. his work. So that's what I find amazing. These artists, who truly, both, in both cases, truly great artists, in some sense, must not have known what they were doing, at least at that stage. But if I has never did anything more than, you know, if I said at her peak was doing that. But you see, of course, when working with more durable things when he went to his three-dimensional work. So that's more durable. But um, it's interesting that they were, and I think there's a lot of examples like that, things which are impossible to maintain. Rothko, the great American artist, I have no idea how museums maintain those things, but they're very hard to maintain because thick applications of, it, of we have two more good questions, and then and then that could we ask the, the maybe would you like to say something, Tamara? No, I was thinking more technological work. So they have the same problem. Once the hardware is not current anymore, like it's 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 tough. It's tough for the, the for the collectors, museums, and everyone. I don't have that TV. It only runs in this kind of TV, so we have to keep right ten of these. <laughs> Yes. Two, two last questions uh, for the two of you. One is from Arte Redes asking what will happen to, uh, with the art fairs after the pandemic? And then Julio Landmann is asking, uh, and this has to do with the millennials that uh, Tamara was mentioning. It seems to me, at least in Brazil, that the younger generation is investing much more in contemporary art than in the modernists. Relative prices clearly reflect this. Is that a worldwide tendency? Um, okay, tackling Julie Lindman's question first. Yes, it is a world tendency. Uh, if you want, you can write me later, I can send you the, the, um, the reports, but it is, it is a world tendency. But millennials are gradually moving towards modern art. The thing is that even with high prices for contemporary art, modern art is still usually more expensive, very, very expensive for them. But they are moving into modern art but they, they have a pre preference for contemporary art and that is everywhere in all countries. And, and what was the question, that, the other one? Art fairs, art fairs, art fairs. Well, what will happen to them after the pandemic? Will they become online? Do you have any comment on that, Professor Schenkman? It's hard to say, you know, in general, people are always thinking about what's going to go mostly online and what's going to, to you know, return to the past. I think part of what, what must go on in art fair is a lot of contacting and talking to people and getting together and so on, which is hard to do. We can do it here. We're talking a few of us. But once you want to meet a larger group of people, it's really difficult. So... You know, I, I can think of that about research, you know, I 
I really, I don't go to the Columbia campus these days because of obviously, you know, they don't want people there unless you need to be there. Um, but on the other hand, I really miss my colleagues. I really need, miss the random ideas I had because I decided to either a coffee and met one of my colleagues to have an espresso and I meet one of my colleagues who was there too, which I haven't, who I haven't seen for three weeks and we talk and we figure out we have some common ideas that we should discuss. That's hard to happen by Zoom. You know, I'm not going to schedule a meeting with somebody that I don't even know what will be an interesting meeting. Whereas, you know, I have to go down and get my espresso. He may, he or she may be there at the same moment and we may meet. So I think a lot of activities will come back this way. Others are going to be curtailed. I imagine that I used to have an incredibly heavy travel schedule, most of it to give lectures. Some of those lectures I can replace by Zoom and I have been replacing by Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, Wonderful. I, I, I agree. I have the same, the same feeling. Um, our art fairs are good for a lot of things, but mostly for research and for networking. Research you can do online and you can do it even better online than in person. But for networking and meeting people when, I mean, even for pleasure, I mean, it's, it can be nice. You go to, to an art fair and people like to do that. So I don't think they'll die, but they, they will probably change. And they'll pro I, well, this, that's not me saying that. Some experts say that, that they'll become a, a mix of online, offline sort of thing. Very good. Well, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Professor Schenkman, all the way from Columbia University and Tamara. I'm looking Thank forward to investing uh, with you in art, hopefully soon. The economy <laughs> permitting. <laughs> it's been a wonderful uh, evening and, and very enlightening. And thank you two very much. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Tamara, for sharing this, uh, this conversation with me. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Diana, for the invitation. And thank you, Professor Schenkman, for, well, sharing your research and was such an honor to to be with you today and with all of you thank you very much great honor thank you very much good evening